Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, this evening, I'm very proud to introduce to you um, New, York best, New York Times bestselling author Charles Todd. Um, the Todds are New York Times bestselling authors of the Inspector Ian Rutledge Mysteries, the Best Crossford Mysteries, and two standalone novels. Among their honors, uh, the Ian Rutledge Mysteries have been awarded the Barry Award and nominations for the Independent Mystery Bookseller Association's Dillies Award, the Edgar and Anthony Awards in the U.S., and the John Creasy Awards in the U.K. Please join me in welcoming Charles and Carolyn. Thank you. <laughs> now we find out if the mic works, does it? <laughs> Oh, it's so pleasant to be here this evening. Um, we left rain in Philadelphia, and we came to rain here, but the welcome has been warm enough that rain doesn't matter. We've had a, lo uh, a lovely evening and a lovely time. So, <clears throat> now we have to talk about the books. The Gatekeeper is number 20 in the Ian Rutledge series. Well, that sounds really grand. But what that means is, if you're going to write 20 books, you've got to be able to make each one different, each one interesting. You've got to give a fresh look to the characters. And now I get to, to do the technical support. You're hitting your microphone. Am I hitting my microphone? I'm sorry. <laughs> my editor does that. When she's on the phone, her bracelet clicks. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, how do we do that? Well, it's not very easy all the time to do that. Every book starts out with an idea. We have no idea where that idea is going to go, whether it's going to be something that we really want to write about, what it's going to wind up as a short story. So what we have to do is take the idea and turn it around. For example, in um, No Shred of Evidence, we had been in Cornwall, and we had heard about several women, young women, who had gone out in a small boat to rescue people from a ship that had struck the doom bar, the sandbar, at the mouth of the bay. And these, these young women in 1897 or so were heroines. They were, were written up in the family history when we bought the book from the house where they had lived. There was a little thing about them, and we were looking at that, and we thought, well, they were heroines. What would happen if they went out and rescued somebody and were accused of trying to kill them instead? <laughs> so we found a story that we could turn on its ear and look at it from a very different perspective, not that of, of brave young women, but one, young women who tried but the one person watching on shore saw a very different story from the one that was happening in the boat. So when we came to the gatekeeper, we thought, Rutledge always takes, because of the roads in England, he always takes a while to get to a scene of crime. Somebody else has already muddled the field. What would happen if Rutledge was right there Minutes while the, while the blood was still wet, uh, minutes after it happened. But because of what was going on in his own world, he wasn't sure he heard the shot that was fired. How would this change how he approaches the crime? What new direction would this give him to be right there, to see the whole scene as it happened? And so every book begins with something like this, that that takes a known and turns it around into an unknown. And the excitement of this is that you never know where it's going to lead. Now, one of the problems that Charles and I have is that we don't outline. <laughs> Are any teachers here? Cover your ears. <laughs> I couldn't outline in high school. I couldn't outline in college. I couldn't outline in grad school. I wrote my papers and then outlined them. I always got an A because I was so good at doing the finished paper. Now, this was very difficult for me because I came from the PowerPoint business end of life. You know, you start with Roman numeral one. 
and the whole concept of, well, we'll just see what happens, was really alien to me. You know, you what are you going to say? How are you going to say it? <laughs> but that, that's what made it that much more interesting. And I think the, the point we're trying to make here is that no two authors do it the same. Some do. Uh, we know Jeffrey Deaver, he's a great human being. He does a 200, 250 page rough draft outline of his book before he even starts writing it. Now, he's had a lot of success, written over 40 novels, 80 some short stories. It, it, it works for him, and I'm darn if I'm going to tell him that he's doing it the wrong way. <laughs> But this is what starts you out at, at establishing a style. Be, first of all, because most people, when they're sitting down to write a book, have no idea how to write a book or where to start the book, much less when there are two authors. And so for us, the enjoyment we get out of it is because we don't know. It's by nurturing and developing the plot and the characters and the setting that allow us, as the story unfolds, to determine who did it. Been to a lot of seminars where people draw plot lines and say, well, we need a red herring here and a plot twist here and up oh, 50 pages action scene. I don't think we really could go in and, and intentionally put in red herrings and, and hide the clues here and there. It's more allowing the story to develop and from truly discovering who the characters are and the, the setting and what the geography and the uh, beginnings of the town and the history of the town bring together that ultimately lead you, lead us to, to figuring out what's going on. Hopefully we do it before you do. We try hard. <laughs> but this is why we go to England for every book. Um, I remember one town in particular up on the north coast in Norfolk that we had looked at in, on, online, looked at in picture books, and we thought, this is a perfect town for us to use for the story we want to tell up here. When we got there, we found that all the pictures were taken across the harbor and nothing behind the harbor. There was a lovely, lovely, what they call a little pocket cathedral right behind us standing on the hill looking down on the harbor. How many of you know what a pocket cathedral is real quick? A pocket cathedral is a church that looks like a miniature cathedral but is pocket size, mini, and they call it a pocket cathedral. But the important thing is that this little church figured into the action in ways that we would not have known about if we hadn't actually been there. What was so interesting was is normally, like here you come into town and there are different churches and different places around the town, but it's surrounded by a, a village or a town. This one was just sitting out in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing that we could see anywhere near this place. So why, where were the people? And, or where did they go and who used to be here? And then you start digging deeper and next thing you know, you're writing a book. That's right. And the characters are so important in a book. Now, there are several ways of dealing with characters. What we like to do, because we find it far more exciting and far more interesting, is to go to the village, get a feeling for who might live there, what their past was, what their secrets are, what their history is. And I'm talking about history of the town as well as the history of the people. And so you're listening to, to yourself as you're walking through the town and creating these people. Now you've got them created. You can dribble them along like puppets, and they'll do exactly what you say. Or you can set them free and follow after them and see what they tell you. Because their insight is often broader than yours. We had one situation where 
um, towards the end of the book, one of the characters in the book decided that he could save the murderer. Almost got himself killed and Rutledge as well. We didn't know he was going to do this. He was sitting in the living room talking to Rutledge and all of a sudden his world expanded in a way that we hadn't foreseen. And it gave a depth to the book that we hadn't expected, but it also gave us an insight into why this man had done some of the things he had done earlier when he might have helped Rutledge. And so letting them go and listening and following them is, is always so, so surprising. And um, I think the most exciting part is that when you're starting the next chapter or the next scene, you have no idea where it's going to go. And you start listening to these people, and they lead you sometimes down the primrose path. What about the man who didn't yeah. want to die? <laughs> I mean, he'd done such a great job. Great character, served his purpose. We killed him off. You know, that's, isn't that what you're supposed to do? It's a murder <laughs> it's mystery after turn. all. And uh, the problem was is the book just stopped working. Some of the scenes, some of the conversations, some of the interactions that were taking place in the book were not working right. And, and the, the hardest thing for an author to do is to sort of admit defeat and back up in their manuscript to figure out, okay, where was it working? And then you get a better clue of where you made a wrong turn. And in this particular case, what we found out was that this particular character had more to say. That their input and their uh, point of view of what was taking place needed that added narration that suddenly, because we killed them, uh, wasn't around anymore. So we went back. We unkilled him, brought him back. Um, he did a great job, and then we killed him later. Yeah. And he stayed there. perfectly. He was fine then. You know, we didn't need him anymore. He both progressed nicely. But, you know, it, it sounds almost Com mystical or comic <laughs> in a way when you talk about letting your characters sort of have their own life but when you're some of the ordinary day-to-day -day banter of what somebody says when Rutledge comes down for breakfast in the inn and the person who's bringing in his coffee you, it's sort of throwaway dialogue you might say in some ways and yet Sometimes in your mind's eye, after the third or fourth time this person's come by bringing him his coffee and obviously sort of knows his habit and what he eats, that it would lead to just general conversation about what's going on in the town or something like that. And suddenly that character becomes much more important. In Racing the Devil, we had a young girl um, I'm not giving away anything if you haven't read it. Uh, but we had a young girl who interacted with Rutledge, and our primary purpose for this character was to give some insight and portrayal of the life of the tenant farmers that worked for this particular landowner. And that was all there was to it. But it it just kept coming back up yeah. and she became such a fascinating character and as it turned out became a rather important character throughout the book that we we hadn't planned on but because Rutledge just kind of hit a chord with this person and the scene worked rather well we thought well he's driving down the same area he'd probably bump into her again and these kinds of things lead into it Going back once again, we're not saying that outlines don't work because there's a whole lot of authors that, that do it and do it extremely well. But if we had sat down beforehand and drawn everything out, and we would have relegated her to one specific role in the book and that role only, 
and I don't think we would have been as open to the concept yeah. of her role changing beyond what we initially planned. Now, sometimes you get into trouble, trouble that you don't expect. We were writing the second book in the Rutledge series, and <clears throat> we thought it would be very interesting to use a dead woman's poetry as the clues to what was going to happen or what had happened. And Rutledge had known this poetry in the war, not knowing who had written it or what the background was. We had a, a, a lot of times they, they printed small books that would fit in the breast pocket of a uniform and he had some of her, her poems. Yeah. He didn't even know at the time that it was a woman. That's sort of on the George Sand uh, concept, uh, her only way of getting published was to uh, write as O.A. Manning, and the natural assumption was it was a man, and especially writing about war and life and death. And he had carried it with him in his blouse pocket that he would pull out and read from time to time. And so when this case comes up that suddenly he finds out that not only is O.A. Manning dead, but that O.A. Manning was a woman and integral to the case. And we had come up with the concept that wouldn't it be interesting if even though she was already dead, this person could provide some of the clues and some of the input needed so that Rulledge could solve the crime. Well, that's a great idea. Until yeah, you I mean, realize. it really was a clever idea. Then we realized if the reader is going to read the poetry that has the clues in it, where's the poetry? So we had to stop the book and start writing O.A. Manning's definitive poems <laughs> so that the clues would be there so the reader could read them. It couldn't just be Rutledge saying, yes, I've got this little book here and I know all the answers. You had to see it too. And we get letters occasionally now from professors of English Lit or World War I Lit wanting to know where they can find Wings of Fire, the definitive works of O.A. Manning. <laughs> And Owen Manning is up here in our heads, and yet, in different books, unexpectedly, out of the blue, Rutledge will quote one of her verses. Now, where does that come from? We have no idea. There He'll be walking along and saying something. You know, 20 books, <laughs> they're interspersed after the second book, and they're interspersed throughout the whole series, uh, and just because it, it works and it makes sense and we put it in and uh, but uh, it's really interesting I we got a letter from a gentleman whose proposed thesis at the University of Edinburgh was on the, <laughs> the complete works of O.A. Manning and we had to <laughs> explain to him that it didn't I mean, exist. He was serious and, and just a lovely man so I'm not making fun yeah, of the a really situation. Nice guy. But this is what can happen when you're writing and you, you come up with what you think is going to be a workable idea and you've got to translate it into something that the reader can share because if the reader isn't with you all the way through the book then you've lost the whole, the whole effect, the whole surprise, the whole intensity, the emotional impact of that book. So you have to do your best to to bring the reader with you without letting the reader know who did it. And the good thing about that part is that usually we don't know who did it. But when we get to about 30 pages from the end, things are beginning to sort of come together and we begin to see certain things, certain pointers. But we don't start out saying, well now, so this is going to be murdered and this is the person who does it. It has to come out of those people. One of those people in that book decided that something was so bad that he or she had to kill another human being to stop what was happening. And you don't, you don't carry this around and show it to everybody. You keep it deep inside. And so drawing all of this out, we have to bring you with us. 
Now, one of the interesting things that has happened with something like this, in one of the books, Rutledge didn't, he, he began to know who had done it. And he did not want this one person to be guilty because there was a reason why the murders had been done that were, they weren't, murder is never sound, but this woman, this man, this character, this person had found a single solution to something that meant more to her or to him than life itself. And, he, and Rutledge was compassionate enough that he understood this. He still had to bring the, the person to justice, knowing that probably what would happen would be a very terrible ending for the person and for the family. But and this is what policemen have to do. This is one of the things that we really wanted to, well, there are two basic things that we wanted to approach. One the idea of the, the true sleuth and, and the golden age tradition who doesn't have access to forensics and these kinds of things. Don't get me wrong, we love forensics. They're, yeah. uh, They're every time we go to workshops, you'll find us in some really odd panels. But uh, for us, it's that, that constant chasing and it's our excitement because as we're writing along, we want to write the next chapter because we want to know as much as, as the reader does. But one of the core concepts to the whole Rutledge series, at least, was here's a man, and I knew I should have muted it, <laughs> and I'll do it right now. I did mine. <laughs> um, but... Here's a man who had a tremendous career in front of him. He was a young and upcoming, talented Scotland Yard inspector solving murders specifically. But then in 1914, he goes off and he serves in World War I in the trenches. And in many ways, even though he's doing it for a just cause, this policeman who captures murderers becomes a murderer for four years. So then when he comes back to investigate murders again, he's coming at it from a really unique perspective of he really has an understanding not only of both sides of why and, and the mechanics of it, but also the one thing that we have picked up from talking to chiefs of detectives, detectives, etc., is no matter, unless somebody's pathological, to go out and to actually take another human life takes a psychological toll on the person that does it. Uh, not to make light of it, but it leaves a mark. And it's through Rutledge's life experiences, his understanding of people and their interactions, and within the, the social structures of the different towns that he visits, that he's able to work on these clues. So that behind all the other concepts, that's really where we started out. A great many officers, young officers in World War I, had to send men over the top into the teeth of, of German machine guns. Um, sometimes they knew their names, sometimes they, they didn't even know who they were. They were new recruits who had just been come in. And a lot of the officers came back from that war with a sense of guilt for the number of people they had had to descend to their deaths. I mean, it was military necessity. It was us against the Germans. And so it had Nowadays, to be done. Nowadays it's commonly referred to as survivor's guilt. Yes, and, and that is something that has been found in, in, in other situations. Of World War II, a lot of the veterans came home with survivor's guilt. Vietnam, uh, any, any war you want to turn to. And, and this is why so many of them, like Rutledge, carried this burden and why for Rutledge it was particularly difficult because his job was to find people who had killed 
and yet he had these men on his conscience, at, um, epitomized by, by Hamish, of course, but in, in, it was all of these young men. And if you read some of the memoirs and some of the, it talked to some of the people whose families had served in the Great War, they talk about this a lot, that my father, my uncle, my grandfather couldn't adjust to the fact that he came home and so many young men that he, he felt should have lived were killed because of his orders. And it's so, very difficult to try and get that understanding because most people that have seen military service, specifically combat service, uh, one of the main things they don't want to do is they don't want to come home and tell their family and friends what they've been through because right. in their mind's eye, what they've been through is so horrible, why should I dump it on somebody else? Yeah. There was the, the old philosophy of I had a job to do, I went, I did it, it's over now, that's it. And yet at the same time, behind all that is all these issues that they are having trouble scoping with. We're very good at taking ordinary people and teaching them how to go kill other people. We're not very good at bringing them home and teaching them how not to do it anymore and to Fit regain their place in society. And so a lot of the times in World War I, World War II, several others, uh, we found family histories where the father or son will go off, they'll serve their years in combat, they'll come home, they'll raise their children, see their wife is taken care of, and then walk out in the back garden and use their service revolver and end it all because, you know, they came home, they did what they were supposed to do, That's but true. they just couldn't take it anymore. Now we've talked a great deal about Rutledge in this context of writing, but the same thing applies to Bess. When they decided to show the woman's side of the war to indicate what the women had done for England when the men were overseas, we chose a battlefield nurse because she could show us both sides of the, the war, the, at the home front and, and the war effort. And we've discovered when we were writing Rutledge that third person worked best for him. We could see it through everything through his eyes. But when we started writing Bess, we discovered that there was a more intimate connection with the crimes she was um, uh, trying to work with, mainly because she was inside the circle and Rutledge, as a policeman, was outside the circle. So we had to turn around start the first three chapters over again and write Bess in the first person. And it worked because we saw the immediacy of what she was doing. Now one of the things we said when we started Bess was we were never going to do Jessica Fletcher. We weren't going to have her come to dinner and between the, the appetizer and the dessert, somebody is murdered. <laughs> in every case that, that we're working with Bess, something comes out of her duties or the work that she is doing with the people around her. The first book, A Duty to the Dead, was where she had promised a dying man that she would take an oral message, not a written message, an oral message back to his family. And he insisted, you must tell them. And A Duty to the Dead, a, a dying wish, is sacred. So Beth carries this out. And when she goes to the family, and tells them what, exactly what this man wanted her to tell them, they treat it as if it's, uh, if it's not, not important at all. And yet this, this man was tormented in his last moments, worrying about this. And her concern is, why did he feel so strongly that this message had to go through? And at the same time, the family turns around and acts as if it's nothing. And something happens while she is with that family that turns it all over and she sees for the first time why Arthur was so adamant about trying to set a very terrible wrong right again. 
And throughout the books um, with Bess, she finds some way to help the people because this is what nurses do. And not to, not to, <laughs> Jessica Fletcher is an excellent example for yes. this. However, I like Jessica, so don't, have, don't take me seriously. You have a lot more latitude when you got about 400 pages to work with and not 40 <laughs> minutes worth of television. So uh, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. One of the things we wanted too was best represents the new type of women that were starting to come of age in England at the time. Because of the Victorian era and some very stringent social restraints on women, uh, especially of her uh, upbringing, uh, were, we wanted to epitomize the, the young women who went on to become the, the modern women of the modern British history rather than the Victorian and empire type uh, part because those young people really made a big difference. This was a time when actually the, the British w gave women the right to vote before the United States did. But in order to create the type of character we were looking for, we started once again thinking about really at the core, who is this person? <coughs> Bess is the only child of a retired British Army colonel uh, who has served his variety of posts throughout the British Empire. Uh, although Bess is re well educated, she's also served in India. Been, well, while her father was serving in India, she and her mother we're living at the post there in India. So we've got someone who knows how to drive a car. We have a woman who is athletic, plays tennis, those kinds of things. Not athletic that we necessarily think of today, but tennis and badminton and those kinds of things, that was pretty scandalous for uh, 1914. Uh, <laughs> and also somebody that wouldn't collapse at the first sight of blood. And she also yeah. knows weapons because she's lived in an, an, an English cantonment so the she, entire time that she was serving with her father. And you, you she's her mother was taught to shoot. She's got a familiarity. She's used to looking at, at patches on the shoulders and telling, being able to tell who's in what regiment and these, these kinds of things which allowed us to kind of speed up the learning curve for <laughs> Bess a little bit uh, rather than, I mean, we just spent all of book one just teaching her a lot of these technical details that she could automatically know fr from the start. But uh, on the one hand, her mother especially keeps her fairly well rooted in what is socially expected of her. But on the other hand, uh, she's a little more daring, a little more willing to take risks, and that's what we like because when there's someone too injured to bring into the aid station, Bess doesn't think anything about grabbing a kit and heading out, uh, where if this was somebody who would faint at the sight of blood, they're certainly not going to grab a kit and head out to the trenches. So. It, it gave us a little more latitude with the character and at the same time talk a little bit about how women's roles change so much in that war. In the United States, we talk so much about Rosie the Riveter and all the recruiting posters and everything. Well, in England, Rosie the Riveter was in World War I. You have to stop and think. The, the casualty rate, you took it in roughly a quarter million in the United States. We were in, Wilson gave his speech April of 17, the war was over by November of 18. You know, we were not in there for a very long period of time by the time we got troops sh shipped all the way over to France. But for England, four years, five million, that's, that was a big chunk. And not only did women 
have to take on the roles that were filled by men in business and industry and agriculture and everything else. But in a lot of cases, these men didn't come home. Yeah. And so the, the change was profound and the change was long lasting. Uh, and how a lot of the young ones, there were no eligible men. So where was the next generation coming from? Uh, it, it had a marked change on British society during World War I that we saw and are more used to thinking of uh, taking place in World War II. The interesting thing to me doing some of the research we've done is that women put the fuses in the shells. Now, I've forgotten the number, I've seen it. The number of shells that were fired in World War I, at the end, they were using them up as fast as they could. Women had put these, these fuses in. They had the small hands that they could do this. Just the barrage at the opening of the Battle of the Somme, which was in July 1916. 16. 16. Yeah. Um, there were hundreds of thousands of artillery shells fired off the I several days of leading up <laughs> to that. Uh, and actually, it was a, uh, you'd be brought up on charges for not sending the brass from the cartridges back uh, to the rear so that they could be recycled and reused. They would melt them down and, and create new ones. They didn't just kind of refit. But uh, that brass was very important. Uh, so it wasn't something they just discarded by any stretch of the imagination. But it gives you an idea how much. And, and these women. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, women who had never plowed opened up fields and grew vegetables. Women drove buses. Women, women did all sorts of things, became postmistresses. But moving on from here a little bit, we've had some very interesting experiences. We've walked in trenches, real, honest to goodness, trenches. We've clambered all over the, the early tanks of Cambrai in 1916. We've, um, I've circumnavigated England on a ship to see how the, the different tides work and how how um, uh, they brought the men back and forth from Dover you and Folkestone. broke your leg doing that. Yeah, well, I, it was hard. Let me tell you, it was awful. Um, she did. She literally got hit. The boat got hit by a rogue wave, and it broke her leg right wave. underneath the kneecap. She but, kept going. <laughs> but this October, we had the chance of a lifetime. A friend of ours who lives in Indianapolis asked us if we would come and talked to several of her groups about the books. And we said yes, and she said, well, if you do, I have a surprise for you. So we went to see her, did the talks, and one morning early, gray days, very much like today, sort of cold and damp, she drove us out into the countryside beyond Muncie, Indiana, took us out to an airfield her husband's ex-Air Force, by the way. Yeah, her husband's. that's how she found out about it. We had a chance to go up in a World War I biplane open cockpit. And the funny Just thing was, the, uh, the, the, the instructor could not take people for rides because according to the FAA, if you take people up for rides, you're an airline. <laughs> Seriously. But if he takes you up for an introductory flying lesson, that's instruction. So he gave us an introductory flying lesson. And here you are, 3,000 feet without a parachute, an open cockpit, the wind is blowing. And he, he, was, he was pointing out things. You could see the railroad tracks. You could see the woods where there might be snipers hiding. You could see where the trenches would be. The artillery emplacements were the big um, feedlots. We came down over the, the, the lake so that we could see what it would be like to look for boats. And, and we could do all the things that a pilot would, would have done. Especially I had a stick when he said, between here, my you've knees. got the stick. Yeah, I mean, every move he made with that stick, I had my hands on. 
had my feet on the airline. So he had explained the, the, the aircraft beforehand, and then he took us up and he explained each movement. Now this is the kind of thing that authors just absolutely love because you can tell people what it was really like. And when she says us, it's one at a time. Absolutely. You'll never guess who had to go first. <laughs> he went first uh, because he was dressed better than I was. He had on uh, a black leather jacket and a long silk scarf. I was freezing. I had on an overcoat. But you're sitting there right directly behind the propeller. Yep. And it was a cold, rainy day in November. It was not the most optimum time. But then, of course, you have to realize that these people were flying when it was not the most optimum time. The only nice thing for us was we had an instructor behind us and nobody was shooting at us. <laughs> That's right. The one problem I had, I'm 5'4". I could not get up on the wing. They had to bring a step stool so I could get up on the wing. And then I had to reach way up to get to the next step and then reach over into the cockpit. Now, if you're 5'9 and have long legs, that's very easy. It took me 10 minutes to get into the cockpit. <laughs> but I was determined I was going to do it, and I did. And I think this is why so many writers try things that they can, when they have an opportunity, and really try to bring the, the reality of what they're writing about to people rather than just, this is my idea of what it was like in the trenches. This is my idea of what it was like in a plane. Now, we've talked an awful lot here, and I'm sure you have questions, so I think it's about time to turn it over to the floor. Absolutely. And are you going to use a mic? Uh, for might be easier so everybody can hear. So the floor is open. You can ask anything you want. Thank you. I have never read any of your books. <laughs> <laughs> That's Just a part, confession. Maybe. That's why you're So here. if I picked up the 20th one, would I have had to have read the first 19, or, or do they stand alone? That's question one. Question two, what's your favorite? So if I'm going to start with just one and read one, what's your favorite and why? Thank you. Well, you can't choose a favorite. <laughs> it's like choosing your children. But what we do is every book is, a, is an individual book. It is a series. There are certain characters who follow along, certain things that happen. But we try to make it possible for a person to pick up any book at a time and, and, and read it. We will come to an event like this. Somebody will buy the gatekeeper. We might come back here in five years, and that person will come in with a satchel. They've gone back and bought all the books. They're waiting for us to come back and sign the rest of them. This happens over and over and over again, which is what we intended. Now, some people, some people like starting at the beginning. Some people like picking up in the middle but you have a choice. There are certain nuances of character development that, yeah. that you will, if, if you were to sit down and read the 20 books in order, right, you will see certain developments, for, especially in the relationship between Hamish and Rutledge. That's right. But to pick up book 16, you won't be sitting there going, who is this guy and where did this come from and why is this here? Um, it's a very fine line to walk because you don't want to bore your existing fan base, but you want to make it so that somebody can pick it up. So It has you, to be accessible. Uh, get the gatekeeper and test the wells. Test the wells was the first. Okay. Is this on? Okay, my question is how... I know you live in different parts of the country, so how do you work together to come, to come together to make one novel? Oh, well, it took us two years to figure that out. <laughs> when we decided in 1994 that we were going to write the first Rutledge, we didn't have a collaboration for dummies or anything else. We had read a lot. We knew what a book looked like, what a, a mystery, how it was, was put together. I mean, you read Frederick Forsyth's Day of the Jackal, which we had read at that time. 
uh, it's, it's one of the most beautifully plotted books. You know de Gaulle isn't going to die, but what's going to happen? So you've got these books to take you through, but that's far different from sitting down and saying chapter one, the sun rose at 537 that morning. Well, what do you do then? <laughs> so what we discovered through trial and error was that if we're going to work together, we have to work absolutely together. I know as much about military maneuvers as he does. He knows as much about the history of the, the different parts of England as I do. We understand everything. If he finds a book, he sends me a copy and vice versa. If we talk to somebody, we write up what we have learned and share it. So that when we approach a scene, like the first scene of that book, the most important scene of that book, we are on the same level and we work it out sort of like a movie. We can see how the action will develop and how the characters will come into it. And we feed it back and forth and we talk about it. Uh, we literally work scene by scene. But not, to, not in the same room. We can't work in the same room. We, we talk too much. <laughs> we really believe you have to go there. You, you know, you can pick up a book about Hudson, Ohio, and know that David Hudson founded it in 1799, that the clock tower burned down in 1903 and was rebuilt, but it doesn't tell me anything about the people that we've had the opportunity to meet and to talk to that live in this town that tell me that much more about where uh, we're setting a book. So absolutely you have to go there. So we spend the most time in face-to-face -face work, actually, when we're in England and we're going around looking at these places. And some of them, we found this town, it was great. Zeppelin got hit coming through the London Barrage. It was losing altitude, took the steeple off a church and knocked it into the cemetery. And the steeple still sitting in the cemetery. Perfect! Okay, we went there. It was such a nice town. They were such nice people, but it just, you know, it wasn't, just it wasn't material for a murder mystery, okay? <laughs> you know, uh, we mentioned it in another book later, but it wasn't until a couple of days later we took a wrong turn and wound up in some little godforsaken town and said, oh, there it is. Yep. And, and we will talk it through and work it through. And the only thing you have to be careful is, is when you're doing that initial talking and working, you don't want to be sitting in the local pub talking about where you're going to stash the body because people will kind of look at you weird. <laughs> but um, you've got to start to lay the groundwork uh, going into the book with that and the concept that we're trying to explore. And then we can then we can proceed from there and you know 22 years and 32 books later we're getting a little better at it. <laughs> the main thing is that as we get each scene worked out we put it into a master um, uh, file and then we build the next scene and then we say well what would really happen in real life here we build that scene and work on it I can pick up the gatekeeper right now and I cannot tell you what parts of it I wrote. I mean, I might have done a paragraph here, a sentence there, a word there. I might have said, well, no, let's change this a little bit over there. I can't tell you because it's been through so much material as we're putting it together. And I don't think you could either, unless he found a word in the dictionary that I didn't know. <laughs> but seriously, it's, it's it's that immersion for both of us that makes it possible to do this. Uh, I know people collaborate in different ways. Some people write alternate chapters. Some people write alternate characters. But for us, it comes together as a whole far better if we're both coming down the same pike together and writing it together. Um, at, at the core, though, the most important thing is when you sit down to read one of these books, we want you to hear a story. 
That's we right. want you to read something that you're going to enjoy reading. You don't want to be distracted by, oh, this is chapter two. This is now Charles is writing this. Okay, no, Caroline's <laughs> not. You know, you want that signal you voice the throughout the book that tells the story to you. And so the, the fastest way for any kind of collaboration to break down is when you let ego get involved in it. Our guiding principle is what is the best thing to do for Rutledge or Bess? That's right. That comes first, not, well, I think. That's right. Anybody else? What made you decide on the World War I time frame? As you, I mean, um, Rutledge is post-war, but keeps going back in his mind. That's right. Bess is in the war. What made you decide on that time period? Well, for one thing, nobody was writing about it when we started writing. Everybody is now. And that's good, because this is a period of history that needs to be brought back and, and understood. We're still fighting a lot of the things that happened at the Treaty of Versailles. I could give you a whole long list of the things that are going on in the world today because of what was happening in 1919. Just one aspect. You look at the Middle East today, that came straight out of the Treaty of Versailles. That's right. Okay, so we, it's relevant now. So nobody was writing about it. We could have a detective who could detect it, the Greek idea that a strong hero needs a strong antagonist. And we could let the two fight it out together in, in the sense that one man wants to stop a murder, the other one wants to stay safe. Uh, it's modern enough. There were cars. We we know the people who own Rutledge's car. We've ridden in it many times. Um, we we like the fact that there were telephones. Not many, but there were telephones. You know, it's not Gadzooks and me thinks. It's it's something that people today can step right into and read. And yet, it's a part of history that that we felt was was interesting. We've been history buffs all our lives. I mean, I ruined him when he was young, but um, history, history is your background. It's, it's your whole past, and if you don't know that past, you're going to repeat it in mistake after mistake. And so not preaching about it, but exploring it was what we wanted to do. And so everybody, when, when we first told somebody we were going to write about World War I, somebody said, uh, you know, that's not going to work. And yet it did, and other people have followed us and written very good books about the war. So people who might not have known this era may have discovered it through some of the, the other authors as well as ours. And, and uh, if think, you're interested in history, that's important. I think, too, first of all, Caroline really loved England, and so I came by it honest. <laughs> I went to England when I was fairly young and have been going there a lot since. So, plus, as I said earlier, the, the impact of the war in England was, yeah. was deeply felt. But also, <clears throat> for example, if you read uh, Peter Jennings or Tom Brokaw's books on the 20th century, yeah. both books will say to you that the World War I was the pivotal event right. of the 20th century. It, it really, set the, the stage for the whole rest of the century and beyond. And uh, that was appealing to us. Anybody else? What made you want to start writing a book to begin with? Well, what the heck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> now, we had gone to a battlefield. I mean, I'd go, my husband and I had gone down to <clears throat> visit Charles, and um, we went to a battlefield, and there was a mystery at that battle. It was a Revolutionary War battle. I was living in Charlotte, <clears throat> so they came down. And we love going to historical places anyway, so I took them to King's Mountain Battlefield. And we, we're coming back. I said to Charles, you know, it's very interesting that there's a mystery there. And much as we know about history, we ought to write a mystery around a battlefield. And he was driving, talking to my husband, and he said, yeah, Mom, okay. And that was the end of that. But then he was a troubleshooter for his corporation. And he was the last man they wanted to see in town. Nobody wanted to invite him to dinner. 
And he called me up and he said, you've got a computer and I've got a computer. Let's just do something. I'm, I'm bored to tears. And two years later, we had a test of wills. I don't think really we set out to say, hey, we're going to write this great, you know, two basic things. If you think you're going to write the great American novel or if you think you're going to get rich, you know, just quit while you're ahead. <laughs> um, it was more the challenge to see, can we do it? And if we do, will it work? Yeah. And it just so happened we sent it off to somebody we knew from uh, going to conferences that took unsolicited manuscripts. And, you know, the rest is history. We didn't have an agent. Uh -huh. didn't, but you have to remember, this was 1994. Uh, the publishing business changed a whole lot since then. Uh, what do you wish you knew at, when you started that you know now? I wish I had known a great deal more about the craft of writing. We've learned it over 20 mm. books. But writing is a craft. It's not some mystical thing that, that you, you reach into yourself and find because you want to write. It's like anything else, brain surgery or teaching or, or driving a, a, an 18-wheeler. There's a learning curve there. And if anybody wants to write, they should look at what, what a book is made up of. Not just chapters, but people and, and scenes and, and action and all the things that go into it. And understand that this is a technique, a craft. We may do it one way. Jeffrey Deaver may do it another, Lee Child will do it another. But we've all found the craft tools to build what we are writing. And that's what you need. You need those tools. You might be lucky. I mean, Margaret um, uh, Mitchell wrote Gone with the Wind in a manuscript like this that was brought down to a book like this. Uh, she had a storytelling technique, but she still had to they had to develop the craft for her. To I write think, down too, it. Caroline's originally from North Carolina, and I've lived a large portion of my life in North Carolina. Um, her father, my grandfather, was a great storyteller. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You, you, you'd ask him to tell the same story again years and years and years on finding themselves because just to sit on that back porch and listen to him tell his stories, they got better every time he told the same story again. <laughs> uh, there, there is something about that storytelling tradition. Caroline's being a little modest. She does have a bachelor's in English Lit, a master's and in history. international relations, so she's got a leg up on me. But, uh, and to, her father read to her, she read to myself and, and my sister and my father. Uh, so things like Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie and uh, Dorothy L. Sayers and all of these great mystery authors, they were bedtime stories for me. They were things that I was, was just accustomed to. It made me a little arrogant when I got to college and was taking classes on Shakespeare because I didn't look at it quite the same way they did. Uh, you know, when you're seven years old going, Macbeth again, huh? Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it comes from that love of, of stories and telling stories and that desire to see, hey, can, can we do it and will it work? Anybody else? There's someone over here. Okay. Um, I work with my son, and I just can't imagine this. <laughs> <laughs> when he was 25, I couldn't have imagined it either. I mean, I love it. I love seeing him every day, but I just can't imagine the, the, the intensity of, and, and to a certain extent, this relationship. You travel together. You write this together. And, you probably have family dinners together. You know? No, not anymore. No. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. I live a thousand miles away. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it really was a case of genetics. My husband was a PhD chemical engineer. My daughter is a money manager 
And she couldn't figure Different out how to, of the head. how to write. So, so you know, if, if I was going to write with anybody, there was nobody but Charles. And I didn't expect to do it. It was just one of those things that I threw out one day. And then because of his circumstances changing, missing his family in Charlotte, uh, that we started doing this. And um, uh, we've had our rough spots. We haven't killed each other yet. Um, my husband was the proofreader, and he used to say that uh, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, that's enough, go to bed, you can finish it up tomorrow, when he would be calling from, from Charlotte or wherever he was. But I have learned something about my family that I wouldn't have learned if I hadn't been working with Charles. I've learned to see him as not the little boy who needed to re be reminded of his galoshes and his hat or not to stay out too late. I see him as a person, a business person, and a, a creative person. And that has been very interesting. I, I think if I weighed up everything that has come from the books, maybe besides the travel, I love the travel, <laughs> but I, I think one of the things that has come out of all of this is a different approach to him, a different way of seeing him. And I think um, working together is, is either going to ruin the family dynamics or it's going to strengthen them. And here, it, I think it has, has strengthened them. I think it is the professionalism, having that dual relationship of mother, son, and professional. Um, I think we wouldn't have been able to do it if I hadn't already uh, graduated from college lived on my own, had a career. I worked in it for a large corporation for 20 years before we started doing all this. Naturally, Caroline will tell you I started working for them when I was 10, but... <laughs> uh, well, actually, five. But it, uh, <laughs> it, you, you really have to look at it from the point of view of... And I learned to have a lot of respect for my mother that I didn't have before about some of the talents <laughs> that she has and, and, and just the sheer tenacity that it takes to stick through. You know, we're under contract for 90,000 words a book and we do two books a year plus we do about five short stories. We've published about 25 short stories. Uh, that's a lot of work. One year, actually, we did three books. We did The Rutledge of Best and The Standing Alone all in one year. And that'll drive you nuts. Uh, but we'll tell it, you that story another time. <laughs> but at the same time, we still have our own lives. She has her life and her interests and her things that she does in Delaware, and I just sit in the sun and go fishing in Florida. <laughs> Something wrong with that picture, but I don't know why. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so um, when you're writing, when you're writing your books, do you stick to the same? You, know, you mentioned you had three books that you were writing one year, which is like mind-boggling. And the best I can do is read six books at the same time. Um, <laughs> so my question is, do you do you switch from one book to the other? Do you stick with the one book? Yeah. You know, and, and follow that through. You have to because we, we always really keep, um, I got it here somewhere. I always carry something to write with because I'm always coming up with, with ideas and thoughts and stuff that I'll scribble down and put in a box somewhere. That's where best came from because we'd come up with ideas and it's like, no, that's not going to work for this. But, you know, and we realized what was in that box and said, wait a minute, that's, that's where these belong. But uh, you, you, you got to do one book at a time. Where, where it gets difficult is, you know, you, you, you send off this manuscript and then the copy edits from your editor come in, or the line edits from your editor come in for this book, and then you're working on that, and then this one comes back, and then the galleys come out for this. To kind of put it in perspective, A Forgotten Place, which is the 10th in the best series, will be released uh, September 18th. We finished writing that book last fall and sent it in. Uh, the Gatekeeper is out now, so we're talking about The Gatekeeper. 
we are currently two thirds, three quarters of the way through writing the manuscript for the Rutledge that will come out in January, in February of 2019. And as soon as we get back from England in June, the next manuscript for Bess will be, it'll be time to start on that one. And so, like right now, since we wrote The Gatekeeper, we've written a whole nother book in the Bess series, and we're now working on the one in the So Rutledge you're promoting series. a book, copy editing a book, and writing a book at the same time. And so you really do have to keep them straight. <laughs> yes, my question is Hamish. His spirit has come to Rutledge. Is this part of the fact that Rutledge had shell shock in World War I? That's Hamish a is dead. Mechanism. Hamish is dead. Rutledge knows he's yes. dead. He knows where he's buried. But there is a situation here where he had to do something for military necessity that was beyond what he as a human being could accept emotionally. And so the only way he could bring Hamish home from the war, knowing he's dead, but not being able to face that, he brings Hamish home in his head, in his mind. He's not a ghost. He's not a, 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 a specter. He's, he's nothing like that. He is the guilt of a man who says, I came home. I'm going to bring Hamish home in the only way I possibly can. It's not a conscious decision, but it is, is a decision that is made to keep his mind from splintering. And he knows Hamish is there. He doesn't want to see him, doesn't really want to hear him. But if he shuts out Hamish, he kills him all over again. And he has to live with that too. And so what Rutledge is dealing with is our way of demonstrating shell shock. Because if Rutledge had come home from the trenches without a leg or uh, an eye or badly burned, he could not go back to the yard. But if he comes home with shell shock, he cannot talk to, about, to people about that. It's considered moral delinquency, a uh, lack of moral fiber. Remember Patton sh um, slapped a young man who had battle fatigue in Sicily. This is something that, that is, is very difficult. We've talked Cowardice to people was, who have was it. was a, a major shame, not only for the person involved, but for the whole family. Yeah. That <clears throat> the offspring of yours <clears throat> didn't live up, and so Sort of like what I was talking about when I was saying veterans don't want to share with their family members what they've been through. Raleigh doesn't have anybody to talk to about he what tell. he's gone through, what he's been through, and what he's trying his best to cope with. And that's why my immediate reaction to you was, hey, Mitch, in many ways, is a coping mechanism. Yeah. It's almost like uh, Rutledge's alter ego. But Hamish really came as we were developing the character of Rutledge, because when you, especially when you're writing in third person, for example, in uh, Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson is writing the, the text. And in Hercule Poirot, you've got Captain Hastings, who is his sort of sidekick. After World War I, there weren't enough people you see, for example, in some of the different PBS uh, series where the, the inspector and the sergeant will go out into the field. They didn't have the manpower right. for the sergeant to go out in, into the field. And so uh, Hamish fit in nicely with what we were trying to accomplish on a lot of different fronts. I think the most important thing to us was we didn't want Hamish to be a gimmick. No. Uh, we Shell spent a lot a of time talking to psychologists and psychiatrists and mental health professionals. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking with vets and families of vets. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why the, the greatest compliment we ever get is when somebody says, well, you know, I never really quite understood my grandfather or my uncle or my father. Um, 
than what he was dealing with after the war, and now I kind of have a, an idea. Um, because we feel so strongly about it, we didn't want to make it cheap. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Now, it was a marketing decision. If you look at the spine of a book on a shelf, the larger the name of the author, the easier it is to see and the easier it is to remember. And if they had put Charles and Caroline, it would be in tiny print. Can you pick up that poster against the back wall for me? Now, what if that said Charles and Caroline? <laughs> so Charles is shorter than Caroline. If my parents had had the foresight to name me Carol <laughs> instead of Caroline, it might have been. But it was, it was a market. I was perfectly happy with that. I sign every book Charles Todd. I do not sign it Caroline Todd because I am Charles Todd in that book. And he is Charles Todd in I that book. I think Amanda probably picked up on this when you and I were corresponding. I constantly refer to we <laughs> because it, it is Charles Todd is the mother-son writing team of Charles and Caroline Todd. That's right. Just like uh, P.J. Parrish is a mystery author. It's actually Christy Monti and Kelly Nichols. They are sisters and they write together under the pseudonym P.J. Parrish. Okay, we'll do one more question because we want to save enough time for the book signing. Uh, you talked about going to conferences and I assume mystery conferences or writers conferences. Can you recommend some and maybe why they're different or what you would choose if you only chose to go to a few? Well, there are two kinds of conferences. There are fan conferences very popular. Malice Domestic is one. Uh, Bachacon is another. Bachacon is the granddaddy of all mystery conferences. It's an old established one in a different town each year. It's, it's the International Mystery Writers Conference. It's named after Anthony Boucher who yeah. reviewed mysteries for many, many years, was quite famous for doing that. Uh, Malice Domestic is for the cozy. Um, Sleuth Fest is in Florida. It's a Learning. Um, it's a conference. fan and learning fan and, conference. And, and teaching conference. I went to that one time to learn something about screenwriting. We had some excellent teachers there. So there are different kinds. Um, we go to regional ones. Yes. Um, they uh, left coast crime, for example, or Killer Nashville. Uh, crime, crime, the, bake in cr crime bake in New England. Um, I've got, yeah, uh, I was fortunate or unfortunate enough, I spent 15 years on the National Board of Directors of Mystery Writers of America and have been very involved there as former chapter president in Florida and national officer and that kind of stuff, so I and know I a lot more about the Mystery Writers, mystery writers <laughs> of America conference chapter conferences that take place, but Sisters in Crime is, is another excellent organization. She's a charter member of the Keystone. Two, two, two different. The Delaware Valley Sisters in Crime. And the Chesapeake. And, and Chesapeake Christian. Uh, That's a good, great crime. organization, so is Mystery Writers. Uh, if you're interested is, in is that from, from, It depends on why you're going. Uh, for example, the smaller regional conferences, the thing I like about those is I talk about Jeffrey Deaver or Lee Child or Michael Connolly. These are people that I've either served on the MWA board with or people that I've gone to some of the small regional conferences where they'll have a keynote or a guest of honor come. And because of the size, they'll only have a couple of hundred people. Everybody hangs out together. You know, and you can actually sit down and talk to some of these people as a fan or as an aspiring author. If you're an aspiring author, there are some excellent, that's why she mentioned Sleuth Fest, it's also the Florida chapter 
Mystery Writers of America mm -hmm. conference, but it's an excellent opportunity to take some actual courses from top shelf best-selling authors that not only know their craft very well, but are very good at uh, teaching the craft. And they bring editors and, and agents. Agents and talk. editors. A lot of them have, um, some of the regional conferences have pitching sessions where for like a hundred bucks you can go in and you get a 15 minute slot with an actual agent or an editor from a publishing company. It's, if you're interested in, in the mystery genre and field, uh, joining an organization just like science fiction has their whole setup for for their type of uh, uh, for their genre specifically naturally we know more about the mystery writer but for example we just got back from the Tucson Festival of the Book the third largest book festival in the country that's for all authors of all genres, and we got to meet all kinds of fascinating yeah. people. Uh, people writing books about things that we didn't even know people wrote books about. <laughs> uh, but were, were fascinating to listen to, and we had a wonderful time. Uh, so either as a fan or as somebody who wants to learn, there are both those options. Uh, but I, I highly recommend it. Well, thank you, Charles Todd. We do have Kate who held up the sign for them. <laughs> okay.